Uh, thank you very much, and thanks, Herb. Um, this is my first time in lovely Liverpool, so a very cool reason to be here. Dominic, wherever you are, can I just say that was amazing? Um, that was fantastic. I am, as Herb said, a science communicator, and I am going to talk today about the mystery of music according to science. Is my clicker working? There we go. Okay, so here, my science communicator, I talk at lots of science events and things around the UK and Ireland and further afield, and I talk about scientific topics that you wouldn't really learn about in school, it's like the science of music, or the science of falling in love, or the science of kissing, or the science of why monkeys can't speak, all those kind of things. And I also host a radio show on BBC Radio Ulster, and it covers kind of all things science and tech, but more kind of weird science and unusual science. Um, but something that people don't know as much about me is the fact that I am a musician and I'm a music lover. Does everybody in here love music? Yeah. yeah. I was in Newcastle last week and I asked everyone to put up their hands if they love music and there were like six people kept their hands down. Uh, freaks. Yeah, yeah, I know. I was like, this is, this is very, very strange. But I do love music. I am obsessed with music and I have loved music for my whole life. Um, it's there in so many of our life's moments. So people put such an emphasis on music for their first dance. Uh, we have it with parties with our friends at music festivals. Um, that amazing video that you guys played at the start, that was very, very powerful. So I wanted to think about what does music mean to us. And I tried to come up with a very pretty quote about what music was, something really inspirational, and I couldn't. So I used one from a nice philosopher. Uh, Without music, life would be a mistake. And I do think that's true. I think life would be very, very dull without music. And about two weeks ago, this quote really hit home with me, because I have a younger brother who's a student. Um, and as younger siblings do, he texted me and he said, here, Emer, could you lend me a fiver? And I said, yeah, OK, what's it for? Um, thinking, you know, it'll be for food, poor boy starving. Um, it'll be for beer, it'll be for something important. And uh, he wrote back and said, it's for Spotify. My Spotify payment's coming out and I, I actually can't do without it. And I was thinking, that is unbelievable. I didn't even think my brother was that into music, but that shows us how important music is. So I decided I would look up the definition. And the Merriam-Webster dictionary said, music is the science or art of ordering tones or sounds in succession, in combination, and in temporal relationships to produce a composition having unity and continuity. That is exactly how I was going to describe it. <laughs> <laughs> but they did get there first. But the, the part of that that I would like to focus on is the fact that they have said that music is science or art. And coming from a creative background, and like yourself, Dominic, kind of combining the science and the, and the creativity, I thought that music fell somewhere more in the middle. So I, hopefully by the end of this, you'll agree with that link. So to understand the science of music, we have to go back to the beginning of music. We have to go back to the evolution of music. So about 60,000 to 30,000 years ago, we humans underwent a mass cultural revolution. We started engaging in things like cave paintings. We started to make jewelry out of animals' bones. And the fact that we started to engage in that creative behavior meant that we were starting to use our imagination and starting to use intentionality. And that meant at the same time, it was likely that music came about. But we needed to find some hard evidence for that. And in 2008, in Germany, we found some really good evidence. There was a flute that had been made out of a vulture wing. And it was placed at 43,000 years old, so right in the middle of that cultural revolution. Um, it was quite an advanced instrument, the way it was made and hollowed out. It had several parts to it. And there were other instruments nearby. So that was almost like our evidence base for the fact that music probably did start around that time. There were, there were quite a few interesting things about this vulture wing flute. Uh, one of them was this guy called Wolf Heim. Um, so I like to call him the flute finder, but he was just a member of the archaeological team that found the flute. And he did something which I thought was genius. He made a replica of the flute that they found, and he just played it to see what kind of music our ancestors would have engaged in. And he found that it produced something called the pentatonic scale. Um, and that's kind of the five-note scale that's been the basis of our musical, hist our musical systems throughout history. And it's the type of scale that you would find in songs like Smells Like Teen Spirit, um, or you would find in Don't Look Back in Anger, or Use Somebody. 
So whenever I was thinking about that and the connection, I thought I liked to think about our ancestors doing their cave paintings, making their jewelry, <laughs> singing along to, to, to Oasis. You can kind of picture it. I think it's so fascinating that we are playing music today that isn't all that different from our ancestors tens of thousands of years ago. So we know when music evolved, but we need to figure out why it evolved. And as Charles Darwin said, music evolved as a sexy survival tool. Now that's not, I'll be honest, a direct quote <laughs> from <laughs> Charles Darwin, because I, I was talking about this recently and someone said, I didn't know he said that. And I was thinking, I'll probably point out next time he didn't actually say that. But it's a bit of a paraphrasing of what he did say. So according to Darwin's theory of evolution, it's all about natural selection and survival of the fittest. So if there is an activity that we humans are involved in that's really, really old, like music, and really, really popular across all cultures and across humanity, like music, we probably still have that activity because it somehow has a positive influence on human survival. But how is music related to human survival? If we look at the birds, that's what Darwin did. He saw the birds use songs to attract mates and he thinks that we do something similar. We use it for the same way. And it does sound a bit weird, but I can guarantee it does work. So to keep humankind going, we need to keep reproducing and we need to attract mates to do that. And music is one of the ways to pull them in. Is that right? The ukulele guys are like, yeah, yeah it is. <laughs> so if the survival of the fittest approach to evolution is correct, you need to think about, well, why, why wouldn't that be true? There's no other logical explanation for the origins of music. For our ancestors, music wouldn't have helped them get food or get shelter. Uh, it would have actually been costly because it would have attracted uh, the attention of predators. It would have cost them time and energy. So it must have helped us survive in some way. And the only reasonable explanation left is that music does help us attract mates. So that got me thinking about the question, does this guitar make me look hot? Or are musicians sexier than normal human beings? Show of hands, put up your hands if you think music musicians are slightly hotter than the average human. <laughs> <laughs> Keep your hands up for a wee second so I can see. Okay, so nearly, nearly half the room. Are you trying to get her to put her hand up? Are you a musician? <laughs> She's like, I'm not putting my hand up for you, no. Um, so it's probably true, musicians probably are sexier than normal human beings. Um, and when I was thinking about this, I thought I wanted to talk about something that I like to call the Ed Sheeran effect. Any Ed Sheeran fans in here? Yeah, Ed Sheeran is a bit of a phenomenon. So this year he won the Brit for global success. He's got lots and lots of money. Uh, he's a great songwriter, he's very popular, he's probably the most popular male musician at the minute. Um, but he's not what you would call traditionally attractive, um, or attractive, but there, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I do love Ed Sheeran, um, just put that out there. But recently there was a list that came out of the hottest gingers. Anyone see this? Anyone in the hottest ginger zone? Um, and it was people like Prince Harry, Damien Lewis, Ewan McGregor, and Ed Sheeran. Um, and I thought, right, maybe it's a ginger thing. Um, and then I found out that a couple of years ago, he was actually on the list of sexiest men with people like David Beckham, Adam Levine, Chris Pine. And the only difference was that they were all attractive and Ed Sheeran was holding a guitar. So I think that kind of shows you the impact that being a musician can have on your level of attractiveness. Um, if you're not musical, don't panic, because there was a very, very interesting study in France. They got a guy to ask 100 girls for their phone numbers, and 9% of girls gave the guy the phone number when they were holding a sports bag, 14% when he was empty-handed, 31% of girls gave the guy a phone number if he was holding a guitar case. <laughs> the study does not even say if there's anything in the guitar case. He was just holding it. So if you're not musical, just carry around an empty <laughs> instrument case. <laughs> Guaranteed to get more attention. Uh, a slightly more serious aspect that I like to think is, can we use music as medicine? So the NHS said that music therapy is a psychological therapy that facilitates positive changes in our emotional well-being. But does it actually work? There was a lovely study by Hanser on depression, and Hanser wanted to see if music was able to reduce stress and anxiety 
in older people suffering with depression. So what she did was she got, she got all these older people, she split them into three groups. One group got lots of music therapy, one-on-one -on -one therapy, and they got, it, they got it for eight weeks once a week. Group two got a kind of diluted version, but they still got a little bit of support over the phone. And group three got nothing. And at the end of the study, the groups who received any form of music therapy had a huge decrease in their anxiety and depression scores, which I thought was you know, quite good evidence that music can definitely be used as a therapeutic tool. And there was a really lovely story that, um, that came out of this study. So there was a lady in it called June, and June was 69, and she had recently been widowed. And her husband, Bernard, um, was a musician. He played the clarinet. He played in big bands. Um, and he had lots of big band records. And the therapist had said to June, why don't you use his records as your therapeutic tools? That might be a good idea. And nine months after the study, June sent this to the researcher. Before I took out all those records, I spent every day thinking that I would never see my husband again. I loved him so much, I couldn't bear to be without him. But now when I put on his music, I feel like he's with me. I think about all the great times we had and how much we shared. I love the records and I love listening to his records. Thank you for giving me back my husband. So I thought that was such a, don't cry, but I did think <laughs> that was a very, very lovely story to come out of a scientific study. And it really shows you how much we can emotionally connect with music. Now, there are some people who aren't very musical. Anyone in the room think that they're tone deaf? Okay, you? Did it just me? No, no. <laughs> One, two, three, four. So you're, you, th you think you're tone deaf? Sing us a wee. Sing us a wee line or something there. Sing us a wee line. There's only a hundred and something. <laughs> I like that you're clearing your throat, that you're actually, I wasn't going to pressure you to do it, but please do go ahead. Okay, well, everyone knows Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, so you ready? Okay, so I think definitely tone deaf. So, what's your name? What's your name, sorry? What's your name? Paige. Paige? I know it said it a wee bit funny, you were going to correct me there, but it is Paige. Like a page of a book. Okay, so what Paige did there was started off on the right note, but then jumped to a note that can only dogs can hear. That, that, that kind of note. The problem if you're tone deaf is that you can't really recognize the small jumps in music. And in Western music, we have a lot of small jumps. So you're just going blind. You're just guessing the next steps. Paige, you can, you can be born tone deaf or you can be tone deaf as the result of brain damage. <laughs> but I don't know if that's something you need to figure out yourself. Um, but yes, yeah, singing does become a bit of a guessing game. Paige, you might fall into the same category. There's something called beat deafness where you can't dance. You're exactly the same. Paige, you do not have an awful lot going for you there. <laughs> so anybody in the room quite a bad dancer, you struggle to kind of stay in time to the beat, put your hand up. Yeah, there should be slightly more people who are beat deaf. So it's a condition that means that you can't really synchronize your body with sound, uh, like Drake here when he's trying to dance the hotline bling. Um, and it was only discovered in 2011. It's quite a new condition. There was a study that found that people with beat deafness couldn't keep up with the metronome whenever it changed suddenly. And it was proposed that people who are beat deaf have abnormalities in the left auditory cortex of their brain. Sorry, Paige, a big diagnosis there for you. But there's 4% of the population are beat deaf and 2% that are tone deaf. So there should be slightly more bad dancers than bad singers. Um, whenever I was thinking about the science of music, I thought, could there be a perfect formula for a song? Um, and there, there are for Western songs. You know, a lot of our songs sound exactly the same. Uh, most are in a major key. They start on the root note. As I said earlier, they have a lot of small jumps and just a couple of big jumps. The music is very repetitive. Um, and we kind of have this thing as humans where we can, we can hold the magic number of seven items in our, you know, plus or minus a few in our brains at one time. So we tend to use seven notes out of our 12 notes that we could use. And I thought, for someone who wants to write a song, follow these rules. Um, um, for anyone who plays guitar or anyone in here, a musician, but perhaps you play anything. So quite a few people, I bet you all know those chords, do you? C, A minor, F and G. 
If you learn those, you can basically play anything. They're the most popular chords. Tried and trusted chord progression. We are obsessed with these. We use these chords with absolutely any type of music and to portray any type of emotion. Um, some popular songs, Ed Sheeran, Thinking Out Loud, have, has used it. Taylor Swift, Blank Space. James Blunt, You're Beautiful. Uh, Stand By Me, Every Breath You Take, What Makes You Beautiful, Let's Get It On. All of these use the exact same music. So, so, so much of our music is the same. So I was thinking, you know, should I give you a take home message? Learn the guitar, learn those four chords, write a hit. Um, and I kind of thought, to finish off this very brief science of music talk today, I would take those four chords, try and write a song, try and write a wee bit of a hit. Um, now, I was trying to think about, try and get this onto my last slide. It's like when the remote's not working. Could you put it onto my last slide? We've only got one more. And it's the best slide in the whole presentation. <laughs> so, I hope it's going to work. Um, so, I thought I would write a song and I was going to use those four chords and I kind of challenged myself to only use those four chords and use nothing else. And I did succeed, so obviously the song is going to be a hit. Um, so once I had my music, I had to decide what I was going to write about. Um, everyone here on Instagram? Everyone know what an Insta Bay is? No? Do you not use that phrase in Liverpool? It's the name of the whole song. So Insta Bay is when you fall in love with someone on Instagram. Like a stranger. Does that not happen in Liverpool? Is that a Belfast thing? So you fall in love with a complete stranger on Instagram and you start to stalk them. Like back down their newsfeed. So you might say like I'm 60 weeks deep in somebody's newsfeed because you're 60 weeks back looking at their photos of their Auntie Sharon's wedding. Do you know those kind of ones? So I decided to write a song about it. Kind of regretting that decision now. Um, since apparently Liverpool, you don't stock as much as we do in Belfast. But can I go ahead and plug this in? Can you hear that okay? Turn it down a wee bit. So it's about one of the many times that I fell in love on Instagram. And <laughs> basically just the story of what happened. Because another thing that I like to use music for is to try and have a wee bit of fun and for people to have a good time. And I was hoping by the end of the talk today, everybody would be leaving smiling. So this is hashtag InstaBay. So that's our C. Getting Ed Sheeran vibes here. I'm just online talking to people. I gets me some wine, end up stalking some people. I'm trying to find my Insta Bay. Then I see your picture and I'm like, hashtag hey. You like taking photos of yourself in the mirror, me too. You also like taking photos of your mediocre food. You even have pictures of you and your dog out on your bikes. I don't like dogs, but I could use them in my photo for likes. Then I see it, cue my heartbreak. This must be a mistake. Who the is she in your Instagram feed? No, it should be me. I've been 50 weeks deep in your photos for days, baby. We should get engaged. There's like 30 different ways for me to find your address. Snapchat Geo tagging on. You thought you turned it off, but baby, baby, you was wrong. Your Facebook checked in to your mama's house Tell her from outside of her window that I like her blouse That girl in your Instagram isn't half as pretty as me Despite the fact she's an underwear model for Abercrombie And bitch, what a witch, I'm guessing she's got no personality And I don't care that her hair looks like it's from an ad I saw on TV How could you choose her? What a loser This must be a mistake Who the is she in your Instagram feed? No, it should be me Cause I've been 50 weeks deep in your photos For days, baby, we should get engaged There's like 30 different ways For me to find your address This could have been for real If 
Facebook relationship Now my only commitment is eating this bargain Buck up at the gravy chip We could have Netflix and chill I got a sofa bed Now I'll just Netflix and fill Myself with garlic bread I'll share your Instagram feed No, it should be me Cause I've been 50 weeks deep In your photos for days Maybe we should get engaged There's like 30 different ways For me to find your address Now I've just noticed You've the same second name You must have married her My life will never be the same how could you do this to us? Do you have no decency? My hashtag insta be is hashtag insta betray me. So I slide into your DMs, it's direct message guys. And as I wait for your reply, tears are filling both my eyes. I wrote, I can't believe you married Kylie, loved her, held her, kissed her. You replied, I don't know who you are, but Kylie is my sister. <laughs> Just got my wee app back out and just wrote back. So it could be me in your Instagram feed, yeah. Should be see, I've been 50 weeks deep in your photos for days. Maybe we could be engaged. There's like 30 different ways for me to find your address. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.